Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Herman Saxano. I'm a PhD student at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, I'm really excited to be here to uh, share this project that we've been working on as well as the stories from families that we've been uh, working with. I'm going to present our paper, Family Health Promotion in Low Socioeconomic Status Neighborhoods, a two-month study of wearable activity tracking. And this project, it was done in collaboration with our uh, community partner, Metapan Food and Fitness Coalition. So um, the overarching uh, goal of our study is to help address the prevalence of obesity in the United States. Obesity is a, an epidemic known to increase the, uh, the risk of type 2 diabetes as well as cardiovascular diseases, and it disproportionately impacting adults and children of low socioeconomic status families. For example, children living below poverty rate are twice to be likely or about twice as likely to be obese compared to children of more affluent families. And, but um, obesity is preventable by having a regular physical activity and healthy diet. And such prevention begins in the family where physical activity behaviors can be supported at an early age. And prior work shows that support from parents are critical to uh, help children to be active with encouragement, in, uh, involvement, and facilitation as the most important form of support. And within the HCI, there's, a, there's been a growing, growing interest in developing tools to help families to be active. Um, however, given the, the, the increased accessibility of variable activity trackers like Fitbit or MiPen, very few work actually explore the use of these trackers in a family setting. And we believe that this is a, an important gap to investigate, uh, given that family is an important uh, determinant of physical activity. And furthermore, families in low socioeconomic status neighborhoods face numerous challenges and barriers to be active. They have concerns about over neighborhood safety, re uh, re reduced access to phys physical activity facilities, cost of physical activity program, child care during physical activity, and limited time due to burdensome employment. So uh, this brings us to our research question. How does socioeconomic contact shape caregivers' perception and use of current physical activity tracking tools? And answering this question can guide the design of uh, future physical activity trackers in low SES context because prior work shows that self-tracking is motivated by people's emotional needs in the context of their social lives. So to answer this question, we recruited caregivers with young children, 5 to 11 years old, to participate in a two-month study. So in the first session, we gave them a Fitbit Alta for the caregiver and a kid power band for the child. And then we conducted interviews at three points of time. At the beginning of the study, uh, one month after the first meeting, and two months after the first meeting. And we transcribed the interview for Batim, and then we conducted an open coding using thematic analysis to identify the emerging themes. And uh, during data collection, the emerging themes were uh, used to refine the interview guide for the subsequent interviews. Uh, so this is the overview of the participants in our study. We recruited 11 caregivers from nine families in total. Um, all caregivers self-identify as black and one self-identify as Hispanic. Eight, care care eight caregivers were single and the median number of children in the household is two. Um, the median income was 22,000 US dollars annually and all families live in low income neighborhoods where the median income was less than, than the city's median. We contribute an understanding of how social and environmental factors can support and limit physical, uh, family physical activity tracking and how physical activity trackers impacted caregivers' attitudes and behaviors as well as their emotional responses while self-tracking. This is an overview of the findings that we reported in our paper. And for the interest of time, we will, I will discuss two themes but we invite everyone to check out our full paper at ACM Dig Digital Library, and the link is up there. Um, so first, I will talk about caregivers' external experiences, and then I will talk about caregivers' internal experiences, so external and then internal. So families in our study live in low socioeconomic status neighborhoods where the crime rate is higher than the city's average. With this in mind, we examine how families adapted physical activity trackers into their living situations. And throughout the interviews, uh, we learn how 
crime and safety concerns were present in, their, in the participants' neighborhoods in the forms of shootings, sex offenders, drug abuses, and gang activities. Given that Fitbit sent this reminder for people to walk and like meet their goal, we specifically asked the caregiver, how does it feel to receive such reminder given the crime concerns that they may have? And Joanne over here, for example, she said that she just ignored the reminders because if she decided to go out for a walk to meet her goal, that could be her last walk. So this shows that the impact of physical activity trackers can be limited by caregivers' perception of crime in the neighborhood. However, as we explore further, caregivers started to discuss places that they're comfortable with in relation to individuals that gives them the assurance of safety. So for example, this father over here, um, he described one corner in his neighborhood that's not very comfortable for his children to play there because he's, he's not comfortable with the people who live there. And on the other hand, he also described another uh, corner in his neighborhood that is very comfortable for her daughter to play there because he knows the lady who lives in that corner really well. So this could suggest that the presentations and the visualization of activity tracking data does not tell the whole story about individual's physical activity. This code shows that um, being active is also influenced by people's relationship with places in terms of social connections, that, uh, social connections in those places. Um, in the paper, we introduced the concept of realms from urban sociology. Realms are social territories within physical places and negotiated through shared histories. And there is a variation of realms. There are public realms, for example, strangers co present in a public park. There are um, private realms, family members at home, for example, and parochial realms, such as acquaintances in a neighborhood community center. This relationship between realms and the assurance of safety emerged throughout our interviews. So three days before my interview with Cherry, there was a fatal shooting near her house. But on my walk there, I saw her daughter was uh, playing outside on her own with her bike. And in, in the interview, uh, Cherry said that she's comfortable for her daughter to play outside because so um, Cherry's mother and Cherry's older daughter, they all live on the same street. So she felt that uh, this, extended network of family will look out for her daughter when, when her daughter is outside. And if Cherry felt comfortable because she has relatives on the same street, Irene felt comfortable to have her daughter play outside because she believed that her neighbors will look out for her daughters. And she will also look out for her neighbor's daughters as uh, their, their neighbor's children as well. So collectively, this finding shows that realms, social connections on physical places, can enhance the feeling of safety. Caregivers felt safe for their children to be active outside because they were, there were realms that were understood as caring for each other. So this brings us to our first takeaway on the paper. The impact of physical activity trackers can be limited by caregivers' perception of crime. And it was the depth of social contacts that families had in their neighborhoods that seemed to empower them to be resilient in the face of disempowering narratives of crime. In the previous slide, um, I discussed caregivers' external experiences, their experiences with places and the social attributes of places and how that um, can influence family physical activity tracking. In the paper, we also reported caregivers' internal experiences namely this notion of attribution to self. Caregivers in their study describe how the Fitbit gave them confirmations about their physical activity capacity. So for the participant, the Fitbit was kind of like telling them that, hey, you, you did this, like you achieved your goal, you, you made this happen. And this led the participants to attribute their uh, success to themselves, and this led to the feeling of pride. On the other hand, when a caregiver failed to meet their physical activity goal, uh, the tracker seemed to confirm their failure. And as Donna suggested, this led to the feeling of guilt. So in the paper, we brought in attribution theory to further explain this phenomenon. Ex attribution theory describes how individuals explain the causes of events or outcomes. And there are three dimensions of attributions. First is the locus of causality, whether the causes are internal, it's because of you, or external. And stability, whether the causes will be present again in the future. And controllability, whether the causes can be altered or modified. 
And within attribution research, it is believed that the way that individuals attribute the outcomes of offense is associated with specific emotional responses. Individuals who uh, attributed success to themselves are associated with the feeling of pride. And conversely, individuals who attributed failure to themselves are associated with the ex experience of guilt. So for example, Donna. So we concluded that caregivers' explanation for their physical activity tracking outcomes were associated with emotional responses that could modify or dissuade physical activity. And rather than presenting physical activity tracking outcomes as goals that were achieved or missed, we suggest that future work should help caregivers and children be aware of the incremental progresses that they have made um, over time. In the paper, we discuss the implications of design based on these findings. And again, for the interest of time, I will only discuss social awareness. So based on what we learn about crime and attribution, we introduce the concept of learned helplessness from attribution literature. Learned helplessness is a sense of powerlessness arising from repeated exposure to negative experiences that felt beyond one's control. However, um, individuals can uh, experience um, can acquire hopelessness when they experience outcome that's enhanced their perceived control. And furthermore, while families in our study face multiple barriers to be active, caregivers in our study suggested a sense of control when they describe strategies to cope with crime risks, such as being aware of their social environment. So, with this in mind, we suggest that physical activity trackers in low socioeconomic contact should present and visualize data in a way that supports families identify places and social spaces that, that deem to be safe and comfortable to be active. And this should be aimed to help families experience uh, the feeling of control over barriers that they may have, such as uh, crime concerns. So one design idea is when we, we can use maps in physical activity tracking tools. However, we suggest that we should perhaps go beyond crime mapping and go for maps that can heighten the feeling of community support, such as local resources map and family friends or, or relatives map. So in conclusion, the impact of physical activity trackers can be limited by caregivers' perception of crime. And it was the depth of social contacts that families had in their neighborhood that seem to empower them to be uh, resilient in the face of disempowering narratives of crime. And caregivers' explanation for their physical activity tracking outcomes were associated with emotional responses that could modify or dissuade physical activity. And finally, by borrowing ideas from research in HEI and health, we suggest that activity tracking cannot be separated from internal, interpersonal, and social factors that people have while being active. And we further suggest that it might be necessary to keep this framework in mind when designing self-tracking tools in the future. So for example, we should look beyond goal setting as a primary feature in physical activity tracking tools and think about how system can help users um, identify friends or family members that can help them and support them to be active. Or think about how uh, we can design a system that help them help users identify places in their neighborhoods that they can exercise and feel comfortable. And we believe that such design can help individuals uh, develop the support structure to help them, to help them maintain long-term physical activity. And um, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to receive your questions. Hi, my name is Melissa Densmore. I'm from the University of Cape Town. Uh, we've done actually almost a very similar study in, in townships in Cape Town. And one of the things we encountered was that actually having like a mobile phone was an additional threat. So I was wondering in these kind of low, low income neighborhoods, two things like, are these families that would normally be able to afford a Fitbit or, and two Fitbits, right, within the family? Mm -hmm. And is it something that they kept after the study or or how does that fit into like what their normal device usage would be and also to what extent did the actual device cause them to feel more or less threatened um, my other question completely different question is is really thinking about you you've, you've framed this around family 
Um, and I think there's family safety, which is really important. Um, but I was wondering, like, to what extent you consider the ways families would maybe encourage one another to walk more, um, and, and how motivation for children and motivation for the the parents or the caregivers or the adults would be would, would be different for participation in like Fitbit activities. All right. Uh, just to repeat your question, you asked whether um, families were threatened when they, like if they have Fitbit. Uh, given the crime concern that may, they may have? And the second question was like whether other families can support each other? Like family members, how, how children and, and parents might be motivated differently to use the same digital device. All right, okay. Um, and then added to that first question is can they actually, do these families actually afford, would they be able to afford a Fitbit on their own? And if you let them keep the Fitbits at the end of the study. All right, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, the Fitbit is rather expensive, but we there are various kind of brands that um, um, that there's like a range of uh, prices. So and we believe that these things be, will be more uh, affordable in the future, and more families will have access to these wearables. And whether the feeling about being threatened, like while carrying the Fitbit, that's that's not something that emerged during the, our interviews. I mean, some families they they noticed that other people started asking them questions about what, what are you wearing, that looks really cool, and they actually enjoyed that experience. And whether families uh, experience um, the, the data, like the, the, the parents or the child experience the, the data differently, um, I feel like, uh, I mean, based on my observation, uh, parents has a lot of control over, over what their children do. So, um, so in designing intervention for children, is essentially descending intervention for, for the parents. So, uh, so one, one thing that I noticed during the, in the interview data was um, it's really critical to align the, the goal in the Fitbit as a health supporting device with the parents' aspiration for their children. And many parents are very uh, concerned about their, par their children's education and that is not something that is supported by the Fitbit directly. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, you. I'm Wendy Rolden from the University of Washington. Um, and I'm really interested in these uh, emotions of guilt and pride that came up. Um, and I'm wondering, taking like an intersectionality approach, you touched on a couple of things of low income, safety, um, but I'm really interested in why did they feel guilty or who did they feel, like did they feel guilty because they were reporting to you, the researcher, that they didn't meet their goal? Or did they feel pride because of their kids and they were going to be a good role model? Um, what do you think about those emotions and where they were coming from? Right, right. So um, the like the feeling of pride emerged from like the feeling that they can uh, beat their set goal. So like if the if they set the goal to like five thousand steps a day and they can meet that, and the Fitbit is telling them that hey you you really walk 5,000 steps a day, that gives them the feeling of pride. And similar with the feeling of guilt, one participant told me that like the, the Fitbit is reminding her to, hey, you have to walk to meet your goal, and she, she's just very tired at that day, and then that led to the feeling of uh, guilt for that par particular participant. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again.